So, welcome everyone. So, this is another session of the student seminar here at the today at the And today we have Carmen Santos Mayordomo, who is going to talk about measuring the photon polarization at LHCb. Okay, thank you. So, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, how to measure the photon polarization at the LHCb. Find the um, at the LHCb group here uh, at the IFIC. So, uh, well, this is uh, the outline. So, uh, first, I will briefly introduce the LHCb experiment and the detector. Then, I will talk uh, about the calorimeter reconstruction because uh, we, we are interested in measuring the, the photon. So, the calorimeter is the, the most important part. And then, I will discuss uh, the theoretical aspects of the polarization and uh, several ways to, to measure. To my service. Uh, these two, the four and the five, are, have been published by the LSCB, and the last one is my, my thesis uh, topic. So, okay, so about the LSCB experiment, uh, the LSCB is one of the main experiments of the LSC, hosted at CERN. Uh, the other, uh, the, well, there are four, four experiments, LSCB, Atlas, and CMS. And Alice. Alice is um, uh, dedicated to <coughs> ion to study the ion collisions, and Atlas and CMS um, want to, to measure uh, with the highest uh, energy possible and the highest luminosity possible. And the LCB is dedicated to precision measurements with a very clean collision and to to well, um, to study the physics of uh, heavy quark atoms composed basically of uh, B and C quarks. Uh, the type of measurements uh, are uh, CKM matrix elements, CP violation, violation processes, and indirect searches of, uh, of new physics. So this is a uh, image uh, of inside of the detector. So uh, as I said, the luminosity uh, is two orders uh, of magnitude uh, lower than atlases of or CMS. Uh, you can see, you can see here, then that uh, the atlases and CMS want the higher luminosity possible. This is uh, for for a field, the field region, but the LCB has a constant luminosity throughout the uh, all the field. So here this is a logarithmic scale, so two orders. For magnitude. And to achieve this, uh, there is uh, this technique of uh, take uh, one of the uh, beams away, so the cross section, uh, over cross section of the uh, of the position is uh, lower. Okay, so um, this way, the uh, per, per bands crossing, the number of collision is uh, roughly one, two or three uh, at most, so the event is, uh, uh, is cleaner. <coughs> okay, so this is the uh, a scheme of the detector, LCB detector. Uh, it is a single arm forward spectrometer with an angular range uh, between 1 and 25 from the beam, uh, from the beam pipe. So this is uh, uh, 25 uh, uh, grads most. and this is the um, the cross section of the uh, BB bar uh, protect, uh, jets so you can see here uh, half of the this is the collision point half of the BB bar jets are in this direction and the other half is at the backward direction but uh, for for economic reasons only one of the arms are is constructed. <coughs> so <coughs> roughly it covers 30% of the heavy quark production cross section. Okay, so this is the detector briefly. Uh, this is the collision point. Here you have a very very good um, tracker uh, tracker detector. It's a very good um, sensitivity. Then you have uh, two rich which are uh, range uh, imaging chain cop detectors to identify the particle one after, uh, before the magnet 
and the other after the magnet. You have two more uh, trackers, uh, one bef before and the other after. And uh, finally, you have the calorimeter uh, setup and the uh, muon chamber, the muon detectors. Okay, so the calorimeter is consi uh, consists of uh, four four parts. And well, there is a electromagnetic calorimeter and the hydronic calorimeter to measure the energy composition of the particles. And then to improve the particle um, identification, you need uh, two more two more detectors. You can see here the, the scheme. You have the electromagnetic, the H cal, the SPD, and the PRX. And between them, you have a uh, a lead, uh, a lead plate. So uh, the different particles have different behaviors when they cross this uh, setup. For instance, the um, the photons uh, have no signal here at the SPD, but the electrons and the electrons does. So the photon gets converted here at the um, lead plate and has in the PRS the equal this uh, this signature. So the SPD is useful to um, to distinguish between photons and electrons. Um, of course, um, the the PRS uh, is useful to separate electromagnetic particles from atoms. You can see here that the signature in the PRS is different for this for this two. <coughs> Okay, so um, this is about the electromagnetic uh, calorimeter reconstruction. So each particle also uh, has a different shape. The cluster, the shape of the cluster is different uh, between all these uh, particles. And uh, one of the, um, I mean, so it is possible to identify the particle studying the shape of the distribution of the deposited uh, energy. So one of the <coughs> one of the challenges is to um, identify the photon, for example, to separate the photon from a <coughs> high energy pi zero, because high energy pi zero decays into a two photons, but these two photons um, form a single cluster. This cluster has a different shape. That the single photon. So uh, the uh, well, a uh, cluster of uh, <coughs> three by three cells is a standard one, so it's reconstructed in this way. But uh, you can use well, several clusters are studied and could be used in the future, like uh, a two by two or a cross uh, cross cluster. So, for example. When you have an, an energetic pi zero from a, if you want to separate a single energetic pi zero from a single photon deposition, uh, we rely on the energetic profile of photons. This is one of the things that I did uh, in my PhD. So this is the profile of a single photon, and um, to to separate this from pi zeros. You need well. There is an algorithm in which uh, you can you can take um, the first and the second most energy energetic cells, and you construct uh, two cells like that. And if the shape is very different from the single photon, then you can you can separate. You can identify the, the pi zero. <coughs> okay. So moving into the photon polarization. So, uh, in the tra transitions of the P quarks to S gamma or D gamma, uh, these are allowed, allowed in the standard model through penguin diagrams, like the, these ones. This is the standard model, standard W. But, uh, well, in the standard model, these photons are left-handed in the standard model because of the weak interaction uh, within the small corrections of the, the ratio of the masses. Uh, this uh, 
this is this can prop the d minus a structure of the weak interactions because the w couples to left hand uh, quarks so this photon has this uh, remanent at, and is also polarized in that way but um, in in another extension of the standard model there could be uh, other right-handed components <coughs> through the through the inclusion of heavy particles in in this uh, in this uh, diagram, for instance, I know uh, Chakiris or Grunos, they could contribute and change the polarization of this photon. Okay, uh, we can also uh, relate uh, the elicity of the photon with uh, the C7 and C7 prime with some coefficients. These are related to this kind, this kind of diagram, <coughs> relative uh, diagrams. So, um, and well, and the ratio of the C7 prime over C7 is this uh, ratio of masses that I put here, dependent on the S or, or the, the quarks. Uh, so, previously, previous uh, to LEC, to LECB, uh, there were these uh, constraints on the right handed uh, C7 prime complex plane uh, from <coughs> the factories. So, well, this is the C7 new physics, so the standard model has been subtracted. So, you expect for the standard model to be at zero. And these, these uh, were the constraints, <coughs> but they are, they are huge at this level from, from two different measurements. Okay, and uh, the ways to measure the photon polarization at the LCB, there are there are two ways: angular analysis and uh, time dependent analysis. For angular analysis, uh, these are two of the examples, or two of the published papers. One is the uh, the three body plus a photon in the in the final state, mm. and the other is the an electron pair coming from a virtual photon. Where you have the same diagram with, but with uh, two two uh, electrons in the final state. And uh, the time dependent analysis, uh, this uh, we can do this because the L and R uh, elicities interfere in a neutral uh, BS mixing. For example, in this uh, this channel. <coughs> As you can see here, you have. Uh, a B bar and a B, but the uh, well in the vertex, if you have uh, left-handed for the B, you will have uh, right-handed for the for the B bar also. So okay, uh, the this uh, first uh, measurement, the angular analysis with a three body plus a photon. Uh, the key here is that you have a resonance uh, that goes to K on, K on pi on pi on. Not just one resonance, but you have several resonances. And these uh, several resonances interfere between, uh, between them. So you can, so you can have um, a dependency in the angles of these three particles with the uh, with elicity of the photon. Oh, this is some scheme of the process. And if you compute the up-down asymmetry, you get that uh, it's uh, proportional to the photon polarization. Well, uh, in defined here in, the, in this way, with the right and left uh, handed contribution. <coughs> okay, as I said, several, several interferences contribute, so it is not possible to obtain a single value of, uh, of the photon polarization but the null hypothesis can be tested. So you can, you can see if the photon is polarized or not. Or not. So the null hypothesis will be that 50% per, uh, of the events are left-handed and the other 50 are right-handed. So that can be, can be tested. You can see here in, in the mass of the k pi pi, the, uh, the different resonances that could uh, interfere. <coughs> and also the, the angular distribution, and you, you have different uh, 
experience and such things. Uh, you have to um, study each of the uh, regions differently. So there are four regions here. So and this is a, the the study for the four regions that I mentioned. You you have to fit this to to a fourth order polynomial with a legend of polynomials and the I mean you you want uh, an up down asymmetry that is uh, non zero to 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 refute the null hypothesis. So well you can see that the uh, angular distribution are different in each uh, of the regions but um, you can see here that the null hypothesis with no up down asymmetry is the red one and the fit to the to the data is the blue one. So it's, it is a bit different and if you if you analyze this data you get um, a total significance which is past the, the five, five sigma. So this is the first observation of photon polarization in P two S gamma transitions, but you have not a, a, a single measurement of the photon polarization. You just say that uh, the photon is polarized. <coughs> another um, so another paper was this uh, a virtual photon going to electron pairs with this uh, this Feynman diagram. So here the set or the the gamma. Um, this is the Q square and the the decay rate uh, for the B going to castar lepton lepton. So if you want to study the photon pole, because this has, this has a very low, very low Q square, you have a, here the dependency on the C7 prime because only the, the photon interfere. You can also, if you want to study this region, it's better to to choose muons, muons for for example. But uh, if we want to study the photobarization, it's better to use electrons and go to a very low Q square region. Okay, so this is uh, the scheme of the of this decay where, where you have a V zero and uh, well, you can define here uh, three angles. This theta k, this theta l, and the phi between the two planes, the these two decays. And if you um, calculate the differential decay rate, you can describe with these three angles and uh, uh, these parameters here, where the 82 and the 80 imaginary are related to the photon polarization, or with the C7 and C7 prime in this way when we can do this work uh, the Q score uh, is tending to, to zero. <coughs> okay, so an analysis is uh, can do this analysis in four dimensions in mass and in three the three angular uh, variables and fit uh, <coughs> these uh, all the parameters these are the two interesting ones and you can see also here that this is the LECB results and this is model prediction you can see here that uh, minus 0 0.23 is compatible with the result 14 plus minus uh, 0 0.22 is also compatible with uh, 0 here so it is uh, consistent with standard model prediction at, at this uh, sensitivity level and uh, the uncertainties uh, are limited by statistics, so we can improve this limit in the next uh, with the next run of the LEC. And finally, the constraints on the right handed C7 prime complex plane can be recalculated, including these new LECB results. You can see here only this, the LECB result with this uh, decay. And the, um, the average of ACB and B factor.
this is currently the limit <coughs> on display. The TS standard model, of course, is zero here. Has been the C7 prime contributors have been subtracted. Subtracted. Okay, so finally, uh, time dependent analysis uh, using the BS mass and decay time. Uh, in this case, uh, well, as, as you know, uh, the neutral B mesons can oscillate between particle and antiparticles as they uh, as they travel. <coughs> um, uh, you can see an example of. Uh, of the process that uh, that is um, what, what, of uh, what is going on, and you can define here the, um, a low, a high mass uh, states, and these states are not uh, equal to the flavors eigenstates states. They are a linear combination of uh, the particle and the antiparticle. Although well, here the the p and q ratio is uh, equal to to the unity. We have not observed direct uh, violation there. So we can also define the delta, so the difference in masses and the difference in uh, in lifetimes. <coughs> okay. So an interesting thing is that uh, from the inter interference between the two different amplitudes contributing to the same process the left and the right uh, photon elicities interfere. So in this case, uh, the thing here is that the phi is the same, well, is its own antiparticle. So when you have a PS that mixed to a PS uh, bar, you can go to the same state that a PS bar that mixed to the P can decay to the, to the same process and these two processes can interfere. So, um, if you compute the the decay um, time of the BS meson, this well, this is the the exponential, the usual exponential, but you get uh, some CP viola violation terms. Um, and if you take um, the sum of the well, so this sign is for the particle and this other sign for the antiparticle. If we sum both we have cancellations of these two terms and the a delta uh, parameter is uh, is related to the fraction of photon helicities in this way with this uh, this parameter here so uh, we want to to fit this uh, this parameter where the standard <coughs> model um, prediction is uh, of this uh, is, is this pretty close to, to zero? <coughs> Here there is a, an error which is only uh, up one. Okay, so in this um, this process, you have a PS to phi gamma, which is a rare decay with this uh, uh, prediction ratio of the order of the 10 to the minus 5. And uh, well, this is an example. Of, on how to subtract the background from the data samples were in in low in low scale for the bis to phi gamma and for the b to gaster gamma that I will mention that uh, will be used as a control channel to to control uh, to control the lifetime because it's a very similar uh, decay. You have a, a very small contribution here physical contributions. This is the, uh, the usual combinatorial pattern. Okay, so the key point here is um, to extract the reconstruction efficiency uh, which depends on the decay time. We call this the acceptance function. We have here in red the, um, the exponential, the physical exponential function or well, with the uh, uh, hyperbolic corrections, of course. But uh, when you see data, you see the blue, the blue curve. Uh, this is because uh, the efficiency, for example, close to the um, close to zero, 
you are very close to the to the collision point, so you cannot distinguish between signal and background very well. So you lose almost all your events. Uh, the same thing happens when you have very high um, decay times because they go um, outside the the trackers and you lose this signal. <coughs> you end up with this distribution. And to to characterize this distribution. Uh, you can extract it from data uh, using this, uh, this control channel with a similar, similar topology um, and or use also uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulations well, we, here we, um, we spent uh, a lot of time one year or one year and a half in which uh, we had uh, uh, some problems here because we extracted in one way the acceptance then we tracked with simulation, but they do not match, so the results were very different. But uh, finally, uh, a couple of months ago, was solved. So now what we expect to to publish these results uh, in well as soon as possible, I would say, in a couple of months. I don't know. So <coughs> this is an example of the of the feed that is involved here uh, as this is uh, a ratio of decay times uh, of uh, BFI gamma and B2 Casta gamma um, you have to do it um, well, you, you cannot apply a uh, usual chi-square because you don't have, uh, for instance, you don't have statistics in the, in the last uh, part so we have to um, Build an adaptive beaming uh, to maximize the statistical precision and to avoid uh, biases. The adaptive beaming uh, means with a similar number of events in each uh, of the beams. So you have the same number here. So you, you have finally the same, uh, this more or less the similar errors. And uh, to do this, also, another problem is since you have a large uh, beams in this in this um, in this last uh, this last bit, you have a, a large width. So you have you have to integrate uh, the the numerator and the denominator between uh, the two borders. So uh, we have to perform this for all the beams and with the PDF which corresponds to the list phi gamma and to the Kastner gamma and this is sensitive uh, with the A delta this is what we are thinking of course, if we do it this way then we can apply a usual chi-square with no problem we can, because we have enough uh, statistics and we integrating, we avoid uh, possible biases because of the pin center is not the same as the um, as the expected result, so expected uh, uh, being counted. Okay, so I don't know. one of the lesson, the lessons uh, that I learned is that uh, you can never uh, estimate well the, the, the project, the timing of the project that you will uh, that you are working on, because uh, uh, every problem that uh, could arise uh, will arise. So. Time for questions. questions. In the plot that you show, this, I mean, the thing you want to measure and you show the background, there were many lines. What did they mean? This? Exactly. The colors. What, what, what did you question? What do the colors mean? Ah, oh, the colors. Well, no, they, they are different um, other processes that uh, are contributing. Oh, okay. For example, if you have, um, I don't know, you, you can have a, a process which is a BS, uh, K-on, K-on, something, and, uh, and gamma, which is a different process. So you lose, you cannot reconstruct one of the tracks, and you reconstruct it as a, as a phi gamma, for example. 
So the thing you really are looking for is the green one? Or? Uh, yes, the signal is the, the green one oh, okay. in both cases, yeah. yeah. And the background, the predominant background is the, the combinatorial background in, in uh, red. Just, just one small question. Can you go to the last plot where, where you saw the ratio versus the time in picosecond in VHD? Yeah. In can you explain in some naive way where, why the error is large when you go to larger time? I mean, naively I would expect if you have large time, you can make it, you can measure it more precisely. Right? As, but here, if this works out like, if the like so, But the question is why this error is the same as... Not the horizontal errors. <coughs> the, the horizontal errors, the, the, the picosecond axis. Sorry? That's the, that's the oscillation time, right? And the, yeah. The next axis. That's the size of the pin. Yeah, this is the size of the pin. No, I, yeah, exactly. This is okay. This is not the error of the of the of this point. It's just the I don't know the width, the full width of the pin. Oh. And what the error is? With just this one. Huh? When you say you, you change the size of the pins to keep the number of events more or less constant, mm -hmm. right? That's how many events. Okay. No. How many? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I perform a study in which um, you can change this, uh, the number of uh, events in each pin, and if you, you go to a, a very low threshold, then you start seeing biases because of the chi square, because you cannot apply a chi square there. And more or less, uh, you require more than 50 events in each uh, of the bits. How do you try to use some Poisson probability instead of chi square approximation? I mean, for every beam, right? Like the log of the Poisson or something. Mm. I mean, I don't know. Mm. But you mean in the original well, distribution of Poisson? I understand the chi square, I mean, the, the, distribu the probability distribution for, mm. for the mean value, if you don't have enough events, then it's not chi square distributed, then yeah. your, your, your statistics is wrong. I mean, Values or something in this approximation, but you can use something like the Poisson, uh, the log of the Poisson distribution. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, but you then it's, it's harder events, to like a couple of the Poisson distribution to describe what the probability of having one event the expected value is half. Yeah, I tried as, at some point and decided to use this, but I cannot. Uh, yeah. but, uh, for for the error is uh, more difficult, not to. Yeah, to start an error from a lightly cooled, but yeah. No, it's fine. Mm. Okay. I also have a question. Mm -hmm. So one of the methods you presented to measure the, the polarization of the photon is to use this three body decay, right? Yeah. And then angular distribution. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, how good are the theory predictions for this? Because usually these angular distributions have this uh, hydraulic uncertainties. And then yeah, maybe the null hypothesis is more, I mean, uh, is more clean theoretically, I don't know, because I did, I did not perform this, but, uh, yeah, yeah, you mean the, uh, the theoretical expectation for AUD, for example? Or yes, yes. I, mean, uh, I think it's very difficult because, uh, you have to take into account all the recent assets if you want exactly. a number. Exactly. So, so you know you don't compare with a theoretical prediction, you just compare with uh, AUD zero, which is not with uh, with uh, the standard model predicts. It's just uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, you just do the, the exactly. analysis of the data without theory. Exactly, input. just mm -hmm. just data. What do you expect from data? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you the, have the, the theoretical it can be <coughs> very difficult. Yeah, yeah. If that can be done or, yeah. or not. You would only have that problem if you wanted to measure the AUD yeah. because then well to measure you can do it, but to compare with the, the theory, you will need exactly. a very good calculation. Exactly. Okay. Well you can compare the um, you can the um, the final season prime that you can do it. You can do that. But uh, you cannot take uh, a value from here uh, of the C7 prime. You just get uh, a mixing of things. 
Questions or comments? So, uh, do you ultimately have a, a constraint on C7 prime by C7, like something plus minus something? Mm -hmm. uh, so, C7 prime by C7, as you said, the prediction is MS over MB, right? Sorry? The standard model prediction for C7 prime over C7 is MS over MB, so it's pretty low, like almost zero. Mm. So, uh, is it possible, even if it is a like, lousy measurement, there, is there some value quoted, the experimental value for the ratio C7 prime over C7? For, for, the, for the ratio, um, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't know. It can be, it can, it, it can be done, but I don't think it's quote. Yeah. But that prediction is very precise for standard model, C7 prime yeah. over C7. Uh, That's the MS over MB, there is no way, there is no uncertainty. There is no uncertainty. No. Yes, there is some uncertainty, for example, in this way. You can, you have this, uh, well, it's, it's related to these uh, uncertainties, for example, of the order. So, if the standard model is, uh, this is a very difficult to see because you have a tangent and sine or whatever. I'm not talking about, yeah. sorry, I'm not talking in the context of this ticket. I'm talking about the general Wilson coefficients. Same prime or the same thing. I don't know. I don't know the, the prediction. Of the, the prediction is you saw it's, uh, it's M as over MB, it's precise. Okay. I don't see any other questions, so I think I thank Carlos for a very nice seminar. Thank you.